and welcome to RIT Sports Zone. I'm John Dittsville. And I'm Kristen Clapp. Since moving to Division One, the RIT men's hockey team has recorded some major victories, but this year's season opener at Michigan will certainly rank among the biggest during that eight-year span. Tigers skating into Ann Arbor to face off against the third-ranked Wolverines. These teams meeting for the first time in school history at Yost Arena in Ann Arbor. Third period, RIT down 4-3, with under five to play. Greg Noyce in front. Puts the backhander in, tied at four. And we go to overtime in the extra session. RIT won the faceoff. Dan Schuler fires it at the net. The puck goes between Jared Rutledge's legs. Anna Hartley is there for the putback. Just 14 seconds into overtime. Tigers stunning Michigan 5-4. RIT has won in overtime. Most RIT fans didn't get the opportunity to make the trip to Ann Arbor and watch RIT earn a split of their two-game series with Powerhouse Michigan. But fortunately, SportsZone was there from RIT's morning skate to their locker room celebration following their thrilling overtime victory over the Wolverines. This is Tigers All Access from Ann Arbor. It's game day now, so we, we wake up uh, 8.30, uh, 9 o'clock meal. Uh, we'll depart for the rink at 10.15 for a pregame skate. I like going on the road, I think, from a team chemistry, bonding. I think those are all good things. Guys get to know each other. We, we pair up uh, young guys with older guys in the rooms and things like that, so they get to know each other. I don't think you want to be on the road too long early in the season. I don't think you want to be at home too long early in the season. So this is, this is a good start for us. Move your feet. We're a little bit more focused on ourselves than we are on Michigan. We want to know what they're doing a little bit, but uh, we won't spend too much time on that. We'll, we'll worry about ourselves. If they're going to come at us with two four checkers, we're going to have to beat their two four checkers by ringing the board. So wingers, pick up the puck. I mean, we can't look too far into it. Like, we got to respect what they've done in the past, but this is a whole new season. They're coming into a new season, we're coming into a new season, new faces. You know, it just got to go out there and play your game. Don't overthink it. We're here to prove ourselves. We're not intimidated by Michigan. We're not looking to do well against Michigan. We're looking to beat Michigan. So we have no problem starting off here, and we like to uh, jump in head first. Let's be excited to play here tonight, okay? And uh, we've got to, our, our feet have to be moving. We don't have to do anything special other than be ourselves. Do what we do and do what we do best, okay? But our feet have to be moving. We've got to be finishing checks. We've got to be hounding people, uh, and defensively, we've got to be real strong, okay? Okay, here's your control four check. What we're going to do, pause it. We're going to blow out our two wingers out here. Our centerman's going to be shallow in the middle of the ice. Our D is going to be deep in this corner, because this guy here is going to come down off the side of the net, okay? The speed factor is what we're very conscious of, and then the strength is winning the one-on-one -on -one battles, and, and I think our guys will match up pretty well in that area. It's the speed that we're always concerned about when we play a team like Michigan. After we have our, uh, our uh, pre-scouting meeting, uh, we'll come for a pre-game meal. But uh, we'll have our pre-game, we'll go back on the bus, and uh, I would say three-quarters of our guys will go uh, and take a nap for the afternoon. Uh, once we wake up from that uh, period, though, that's when the guys will, uh, the game faces are really on and a much more serious, quiet tone as we go on the bus and, and head towards the rink. And, and, uh, be ready for battle. Well, uh, Michael Kolovec uh, had a bone chip that had to be removed. It's short term, uh, roughly three weeks, and we'll see where he stands. I, I think by no, first of November he should be ready to go. But he's our leading scorer from last year, so we've got to replace someone that was able to put pucks in the net for us. And uh, Matt Garbowski just pulled his groin, uh, tweaked it just before the weekend, so we're going to set him out this weekend. Uh, captain, really a guy that did a whole lot for us. But we've got a lot of young guys that. Uh, getting a chance to play here is going to go a long way in their development. Okay, here we go now here. Waddy started us off here tonight. Josh being the junior, we said let's go with uh, Josh first and we'll go with Jordan tomorrow night. And uh, it's predetermined and uh, uh, we expect them both to play well. Uh, we know they both can play well, but uh, depending on how the game goes uh, is not uh, determining who's going in tomorrow night. We already know who's doing that, and we'll give them both a shot to evaluate them. Hi again, everyone, and in the 90th season of Michigan hockey starts tonight in the 2012-2013 season as Michigan opens here at home at the newly renovated and beautiful Yost Arena against 
Rochester Institute of Technology, known as RIT. Play assertive, a lot of confidence here tonight. Believe in ourselves here. Believe what we're doing is the right thing, and we're going to attack it right here off the get-go tonight. We'll make adjustments as we move along here. Play hard, play smart, let's have some fun here now, guys. Michigan now has a two-man advantage. Here's a Truba. He waits to Bennett. Shot score! Matt Bennett right from the blue line. And bango! It's 2-0. You're on your heels. Let's get going here. You're hearing footsteps. You're slow. You're reacting to them. You're not bringing it. Now let's get going. Here goes Truba up the ice on the right-hand side. Jacob Truba. He'll go in behind the goal. Rubber up. Try score! Jacob Trubo with his first goal as a Michigan Wolverine. A power play goal making it 3 nothing. We've got to get competitive and start manning up here. Okay, you've got to decide if you really want it or, ah, it's pretty cool playing here. Okay, because right now, right from our senior class right on down, we're very, very tentative. We're not getting in the win in the battles. We're scared. Compete! We got our wake-up call. Came early this year. First, first period in a real game on the road. But we're better than that. We got to chip away here. Chip away and let's get going here. Now the Wolverines are trying to chip it out of the zone. They do, and up the ice comes Kevin Lynch. Lynch on a breakaway. Lynch moving in front. And oh, the shot back up to him. What a save by Watson. And we'll have a stoppage of play. OK, a little bit better period here. Just keep competing here. Let's have our best period this period here. We know we can play better than what we have. So Hyman whacked at it, trying to get it out of the Michigan zone. It came, they score! Above Rutledge's shoulder, it was stolen and put in the goal by Elliot Rabel. Now the Tigers play it deep in the Michigan zone. Luke Moffitt in the corner. Oh, he gave it right up in front of the goal! And here's a shot of the goal. They have tied the game. Nice with a giveaway by the Wolverines in their defending zone. And it's all tied at four. Hearts, Ponzi, Schuler start us off. And it's an overtime. Here they come. Long shot wide of the Michigan goal. And another shot right in the legs. Oh, right behind the goal. It goes in. They went right through the legs of Jared Rutledge, and RIT has won in overtime. This shouldn't surprise us. I mean, you go down, since we've gone Division I, whether it be Minnesota, Minnesota, Cornell at Cornell, Denver, UNH, it doesn't matter. We've played all the ranked teams. There's no one to be afraid of. And hey, they have X amount of talent, and we, and we respect that. But so do we here. So I, I thought a great win. And, and, and that's, that's the bottom line, and, but we expected to win a game here, if not two. It's, it's great All, for anybody. For anybody coming here and beat this, this um, quality team in their barn would be a huge confidence booster. And doing that for us, uh, Atlantic hockey team, um, just shows that we can play with anybody in our, in our conference, can play with anybody as well. It's huge. It's everything. Uh, coming in uh, with the number one, two ranked team in the nation, uh, we come in and uh, steal one from them. I mean, everyone realizes the potential that we have for the season now. It kind of sets the tone for the rest of the season. Welcome back to Sports Zone. For the third straight year, RIT had no problem filling the Blue Cross Arena for Brick City Homecoming. In fact, the game sold out 103 hours before the puck even dropped, making it the fastest sellout in school history. RIT facing Division I newcomer Penn State, third period. The Nittany Lions up 2-1 on the power play. Max Gardner beats Josh Watson to give Penn State a two-goal cushion. RIT would answer. Jeff Smith, the highlight of the night, a great individual effort to bring the Tigers back to within one at 3-2. 
RIT played the final four minutes on the power play and they pulled Josh Watson for an extra attacker with 124 left. But all 11 shots on net during that span were stopped by PJ Musico as Penn State shocked the Tigers 3 to 2. It was a night of missed opportunities for RIT, but none bigger than the final five minutes when thanks to a penalty, the team had a man advantage but couldn't get the equalizer. Coach, can you talk a little bit about the five minute penalty you guys kind of had at the end? Well, I, I thought we did very well in the last five minutes. Unfortunately, we waited for the last five minutes. Uh, to me, the game was won or lost in this case uh, in the first 40 minutes. I didn't, I didn't think we played with any sense of urgency. We played at a pace. We turned it on in the third period, but it was just too late. And uh, they had strong goaltending to, to shut us down. But the last five minutes, besides scoring, I think we did everything else pretty well. We got pucks to the net. We created some opportunities for ourselves. The goalie came up big. and. They got a good uh, penalty kill at the end for a big win for their program. Can you talk a little bit about the goaltender for Penn State and how he played tonight? <laughs> he stopped a lot of shots. Uh, his rebounds just couldn't get on him. I mean, they, they were good around the net, and they, they did a good job. I mean, they worked hard today. They came in, and uh, they played well in front of him, and he was a good backstop for him. Can you talk a little bit about the defensive lapses that led to the two goals by Penn State? Yeah, they were just two mistakes, and they took they took uh, full advantage of them. And got to give credit to them, but uh, we we got to clean up our defensive zone for sure. It's just uh, communication, a lot of communication, and things like that. But um, other than that, like some basically puck luck, uh, we had some bounces that just didn't go our way, and they end up on their stick, and uh, they capitalize on their opportunities. Penn State didn't seem too intimidated coming into this big arena. What did you think about that? Well, I think the fact that we got off to a very slow start, I think uh, they got we we let them get comfortable in what uh, we would consider at our rink here tonight and uh, by just playing with no edge but just very average I thought uh, that they should get comfortable we didn't put much pressure on them throughout the first two periods until the third and and then it was just too late what can you guys really take away from this game coming off a loss like this it's it's a kick in the butt I mean we got to get going um, we're just you know, sometimes going out there we got to go out there every single time we have to go out there wave after wave we have to finish our checks we have to be going hard every single shift can't take shifts off and then uh, tonight we came out flat I think and uh, it really cost us yeah obviously you want to come in and play well we got 10,500 fans that play in front of us so you want to come in play well for them and everything like that and um, we brought it at times and then other times we kind of had lapses that cost us the game. Uh, it's more of a letdown like we feel like we let everyone down so um, yeah it's definitely frustrating but uh, it's disappointing as well and we can't we wish we could have uh, had these all these fans leave with the W but um, that's the way that that's why you play the game so uh, we're gonna move on from here and hopefully get uh, a W next weekend so. He kicked it himself and he put it in off his stick. The RIT women's hockey team also called the Blue Cross Arena home for Brick City. Lady Tigers welcomed Yale to town. First period, RIT led 1-0, and on the attack, the Tigers crashing the net, and Celeste Brown puts in the power play goal, her third of the year. It was 2-0 RIT in the second, again on the power play. Erin Zach from behind the net, she gets it to go for her first on the year. RIT shuts out Yale, three zip. Just a reminder that Sportsome will carry nine RIT women's hockey games this season. Our next live broadcast comes up Saturday, November 10th, when the Tigers host Syracuse at 2 o'clock. It's been nearly two years since alumnus Steve Schultz donated $1 million to RIT officially kicking off the school's power play campaign to build a new ice arena on campus. Last November, that future home was officially named thanks to a $4.5 million donation from the Policini Foundation and Tom Galisano. As Courtney Tennant reports, RIT has broken ground and the Tigers will soon call the Gene Policini Center their new home. Two years from now, the RIT men's and women's hockey teams will have a new home in the Gene Policini Center. To kick off Brick City Weekend, the RIT community gathered for the groundbreaking of the new arena. Three, two, one, Finally, the groundbreaking. How excited are you? Very excited. Um, it's going to be even more for the ribbon cutting, but 
Look at this response, just amazing. So it's great to see the excitement here on campus as well from the student body and the team. You know, they come up and talk like, wow, we can't wait to play in this arena. So it's just amazing. And the band, I mean, everybody's excited. How could you not? What does it mean to finally be here with the groundbreaking ceremony? I think it becomes that much more of a reality. Uh, you know, we've been going through the process, but it, it certainly feels that way. As I've said before now, for two years, I'll be walking over to this piece of ground over here and see, okay, what they do today? And geez, it seems slow. And then all of a sudden it gets put up real quick. It just, it's, it's amazing to watch how they do these projects and how much work really does go in. And uh, we've got great people working with us with LaChase here from Rochester and BBB out of Toronto uh, Architects. I think it's been a great group to work with. How will RIT focus on bringing back the intimacy that Ritter offers? Well, there's always, the, there's always the chance, there's always the risk of losing that feel that we've had since the 1960s in Ritter Arena. It grows with every year. I mean, the, the, the whole aura of being in Ritter is, is amazing. This arena is being built with that feeling in mind. Just the intimacy of the, of the building, the way it's structured, uh, will keep that in mind, and I, I believe it'll carry it over very well. They did a very good job of getting a feel for what our rink is like and are trying to duplicate that as much as possible. And I think when you go new, you lose a little bit of that. But I think the fact that our volume will almost triple or you know double in some, uh, I think will more than make up for that. As much as we love the Ritter, the community, the fans needed something more. Uh, the amenities for them had to improve uh, for them to just enjoy the experience more. And we're going to do that uh, tenfold. What does this new arena offer that Ritter may not? <laughs> More seats, real seats. Uh, it'll be a you know NHL size rink. Uh, we'll have actually a nice club and a place where you can get drinks and food if you're of age. Uh, but most importantly, we're going to have a you know a great atmosphere for RIT hockey, and we'll be able to bring in the best teams from around the country to RIT because they're going to want to play in this facility. What does an arena like this mean to RIT as a community? It will change the, uh, the fabric of this community. It's going to change the, uh, the way people look at one another, the way that people look at this university. We have a lot of buildings on this campus. There's beautiful buildings and academic buildings and sports buildings. But this is going to be a one-of-a-kind facility, totally dedicated to building school spirit, to build uh, pride among uh, the university. I'm excited about it because uh, men's and women's hockey are, will send a message about our sports program uh, to the rest of the community about what we're all about. Uh, so I think I think it's uh, it's more than bricks and mortar. Well, look, I mean, we just had an exhibition game against the University of Ottawa, and we practically sold out Ritter. Okay, so that tells you what the problem is. We have so many people want to come see the games. We have people who won't come in from the community because they know they're all sold out. So I think this is a real important step for not just RIT, but for the community of Rochester. And I think it'll be a great place for the community to come and, and cheer on our Tigers. The Gene Paulusini Center will seat 4,150 fans and will accommodate 350 standing room only. The arena, which is scheduled to open in the fall of 2014, will be three times the size of Ritter with suites and the team store. Chelsea Shoemaker was a rising star on the RIT women's soccer team. She led the Tigers in assists her freshman year and was one of the team's top scorers during her sophomore season. But as Emily Clark reports, Shoemaker's junior campaign was put on hold for an entire year after a major injury and an unfortunate accident. Last year, Chelsea Shoemaker's season was over before it officially started. Last fall, we went through our normal preseason, and then in our first scrimmage, um, we host a scrimmage here on campus, and in our first game against Geneseo, um, a girl took me out from behind and ended up blowing out my knee, um, ACL, MCL, meniscus. And it's a very common injury, especially with female soccer players. Um, and so once it happened, I was obviously very disappointed. Um, you know, I had worked hard leading up to the year, um, was excited to get on the field with my teammates. And so obviously there's the emotional side of it of, you know, after working so hard being like, okay, you know, it's done. Already facing a long recovery, Chelsea then suffered an even greater setback. Fast forward four days, um, I just found out my surgery date. 
and coming back with my dad was when the accident happened. The injuries I sustained from the accident, um, besides for a lot of like bumps, scrapes, bruises, blood, um, really was my arm shattered. Um, when we hit, I turned and the whole right side of me was what was mostly affected. So um, after like being cut out of the car, going to the hospital, um, you know, being in the trauma room, they ended up having to do reconstructive surgery on my arm. Now, you injure your knee and you're told you can't play for six months and then you get in a car accident four days later and all of a sudden you're out until who knows when. Would you say that was an ultimate low for you? I think the biggest thing for me was it just really put life into perspective. Um, you know, I live a really fast-paced life and I'm always very busy and I've never had something that's really put me completely down and out before. Chelsea took a medical leave from school to focus on her recovery. For a good four or five months, I spent, you know, four hours a day, two hours on my knee, two hours on my arm. Um, and, you know, it was obviously really painful, but I think the biggest thing for me um, was knowing I had, like, a family here and that I could always rely on them and how invested everyone else was in my recovery as well. What were some of the things that you said to her or really wanted to make sure she understood? I just tried to tell her that she had to keep in mind where she was going and that um, as much as she wanted to feel badly and there were moments where where I just allowed her to say you know what I feel I just want to take this moment and feel really bad for myself and I thought that that was fine but then we also identified the moments where now's the time where you need to focus on your teammates you need to focus on the team mm -hmm. and hopefully that'll help pull you out of this moment where you're focused on the bad things and you can remember what it is that you're working towards. While she couldn't be on the field or in the classroom, Chelsea found comfort in her role as president of the Student Athletic Advisory Committee. I really credit that role um, to her recovery last year because when she got hurt, she threw herself into that job. You know, she didn't have the soccer field anymore to go be an outlet for her and um, SAC really became her outlet. Is there anyone who knows that there's other people coming who aren't here yet? Being able to throw myself into other things, other activities here on campus like SAC um, because I knew that you know I wasn't able to compete on the field and I wasn't able to you know be a student in the classroom so I really had to find where I was able to still apply myself and you know feel needed and feel wanted. After nearly a year of ups and downs Chelsea returned to the field in August. When she was finally able to get back onto the field did you notice any hesitation or was it pure determination um, in terms of her just getting back into it? She wanted it really badly. You know, she worked so hard for so long that that moment when she was finally able to step on the field again was really rewarding for her. And it's still a, a work in progress. You know, she's still building back and getting to the point that she was at. Um, but every day she gets closer. Preseason was tough. It was it was not a walk in the park. Obviously. Um, you know, after playing a couple years here and then having to step back and almost start over, um, I think, you know, at times it was emotional, but I think I just really wanted to be back on the field and um, being able to step on the field for the first time in a game uh, was really exciting. Well, that does it for this edition of RIT Sports Zone. Don't forget, we're always on it, RITSZ.com. And you can also stay up to date with Sports Zone by following us on Twitter and friending us on Facebook. So until next time, thanks for joining us in the zone.